morning, 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 or afternoon, or evening, whenever you are listening to this. Hello, my name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr., and welcome to my podcast, Darling, I'm Depressed Again, Don't Tell My Mother, where we discuss mental health, mental illness, and everything relating to it for Bahamians, black people, college students, high school students, primary school students. Once you're a person, once you have mental health, we're discussing it. I am overjoyed, privileged, all of the adjectives that you could possibly come up with. I am all of those things to be speaking to you all today. I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. Now, a bit of a disclaimer. I am not a mental health professional. Okay, I'm going, I can repeat it one more time. I am not a mental health professional. I am not certified, nor have I ever worked in the mental health field. Any advice given or any perspective shared on this podcast are to be taken with a grain of salt. Also, if you are easily scorned, please, I am warning you now, do not listen to this story. Okay, now, before we begin, there's a thing that we are going to do every episode, a word of the day or night or evening, whenever you listen to this, a word of the episode. And the word for this episode is shame. So this episode, we're talking about shame, how to overcome with, how to overcome it, how to deal with it. Now, as indicated by the title of the episode, I couldn't think of a more fitting opening than the time that I, myself, in the fifth grade. And the pause was intentional. Now, I know what you're thinking, John, you in the fifth grade. At this time, you kind of, you you old enough to know how to go to the bathroom. What are you doing nannying? Nannying is the word for, you know, pooping. What are you doing nannying, defecating, excreting feces on yourself? Why are you doing this in grade five? I wanted to be known. First of all, let me put this on the record. And let me put this on the record right now. I didn't go to school to nanny up myself. No one goes to school with the intention of nannying up. The... I went to school that morning with the mindset. I can sit down, do my work, eat my lunch, do my arts and crafts, and go home. You hear that? I can sit down, do my work, eat my lunch, do my arts and crafts, and go home. There is nowhere on that agenda where it shows John had plans of nannying up himself. I never went to school with the concept or idea in my head. You know what? Today, mm -hmm. today. I can nanny up myself. Yup. Yeah, see, I didn't go to school. I didn't have that. I didn't, I didn't plan that. But it happened. And it happened like this. So I always carried lunch to school. Always rain or sun. We ain't, we ain't got no snow. So rain or sun, <laughs> I always brought a lunch with me. Because my daddy made me lunch and he's an amazing cook. So why not? Now, on this particular day, I had fish. And you know, this was an abnormal occurrence because I've had fish before and it didn't break my belly every time I had a fish finger. But on this particular day, I realized after eating the fish that something wasn't right. It was like my stomach turned inside out for half a second and then it was normal. Keep in mind, I didn't nanny myself right at that moment during lunchtime. Oh no, because that would have been too easy for me. You know, because that that I could have just... Pretend like everything okay. No, no, that would have been perfect. What had to happen was I went back to class. I went back to class. And you know, everything's going good for a little while. I'm writing, even though my stomach doing a little bruh, bruh, bruh. that's the sound my stomach started to make. Bruh, bruh, bruh. But that was okay. That was okay because, you know, stomachs do that, I thought in my head at the time. Sometimes your stomach hurts a bit. That's okay. And then my stomach did the... And when I hear the... Come in, I know something wasn't right. Because the minute my stomach did the... My whole body felt like it was flipped right side up. And my whole... Everything inside went lopsided. So I raised my hand. And I you no, know, I raised my hand to go to the bathroom. Because I could feel it coming. You know, like like a storm. You could feel the storm coming. You could the air smelled different. 
You know, the air tastes different when the storm coming. I could feel it coming. My teacher took a while to get to me. She took, a little while, she took a little while to tell me I could go to the bathroom. And when she told me I could go, I take off running down the hallway. I say, you won't get catch me this time. I take off running. The second I got to the bathroom door, the nanny just explode. I exploded. I didn't even make it to the toilet. I didn't make it to the toilet literally inside my pants. I defecated all over myself. Now, I want you to put this picture in your head. It was literally so bad that the bathroom was put out of order for that day. And inside your head, I want you to picture this little boy if you don't know what I look like, just picture any little boy, doesn't matter, who just pooped himself in the fifth grade. So you know he big. He ain't no, this ain't no first grader. Oh no, first grader, you could get away with it. Second grade, maybe. By third grade, you're pushing it. But a fifth grader? Not even up himself? Oh no, he in shock. He ain't supposed to be doing that. That's what was going on inside my head. I'm in shock. First of all, I was ashamed, word of the episode, I was ashamed of myself, first of all, because I wasn't supposed to be doing that. Me, big boy in fifth grade, even though I was sick. Like, like, you know, I had gotten sick from whatever I had eaten. I wasn't supposed to be doing that. And I was in so much shock. I didn't act logically. The smart thing to do would have been to take off the underwear and throw it away, try to get myself cleaned up, or to walk home to my house, literally a couple streets away from the school, and risk getting in trouble for leaving school. That would have been the smart thing to do. But you know, I've never been known to do the smart thing at times. You know, you know what I did? I pulled up my pants. Leaving the feces on myself and I walked back to class mm -hmm. I went back to class I went inside the classroom my lips were pinned up silent sealed and I sat down in my seat I sat down in my seat and for a little while everything was normal you know Everything was cool. And I'm thinking in my head, oh, Jesus, don't let them smell it. God, please don't let them smell me. God, please don't let them smell me. All the while saying, God, God saying, buddy, this thing come with wisdom. You're nanny up yourself. Come on now. Come on. But in my head, I'm saying, God, please, I, I have faith. God, please don't let them smell me. And this one girl, this one girl, I'll never forget. This was the catalyst. Well, actually, technically speaking, me eating the lunch was the catalyst, you know, to me not up myself. But this was the catalyst to the greater shame. She said, the girl, Mmm, y'all smell that? If I could have allowed the earth to swallow me at that point in time, I would have. But me being me, me thinking, okay, maybe I can switch attention away from myself. I quickly said, I don't smell anything. Everyone turned around to look at me. And now everyone noticed the smell was coming from me. So, you know, events went on. I had to go inside the classroom. The principal was called. He asked me if I, you know, not me myself. I said yes. And then he, <laughs> he sprayed me with a can of Febreze. He sprayed me with a can of Febreze. You know, that was a very powerful moment. And then I had to go and stand up outside of class because I couldn't stay in the class. Come on now. I couldn't stay in the class in that scent. It's an offensive odor, you know. But it just so happened that the place where I was put was a place from which... Everyone could see me when the bell rang for break. 
And I remember the bell ringing for break, people walking past me, laughing, and then going back to class when the bell rang for break to end. And this instance, this entire situation, was one of the most embarrassing and shameful moments of my life. Hands down. Because having, it was already one thing to know that I had messed up, right? Literally and figuratively. But to have everyone witness that, it was like, oh crap. Pun, int- pun not intended. And when dealing with and when dealing with this situation, I wasn't able to talk about it for years, you know, without feeling some type of embarrassment or, you know, self-loathing. How could you do that? You were too old for that. Why would you do that to yourself? I couldn't talk about it because I was so ashamed of what I had done that any thought process or any retellings of the story or anything in that model, it made me upset, you know, because it was a bit of a slightly dramatic moment. And I heard the story a lot through the years because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that's easily forgotten. And it happened at a relatively late part of my primary school journey so it wasn't like a create one story and people would forget no this was grade five like i said earlier on so i heard the story multiple multiple times and each time i heard it it's like the shame just came come came back to me each time i heard it the shame came back to me so it was like i would you know go weeks at a time i would go months at a time without hearing the story and then Someone would mention it, and instantly I was flung back in time to when I was in grade 5, standing up in that bathroom, with all over me, right? And when we're ashamed, we begin to ask ourselves questions, or some of us do, I know that I do. What could I have done differently? How can I forget this? What can I do to make myself forget this right now? How can I get rid of this? Okay, how can I deal with this? How do I get over this? And so what I did was, I tried to avoid it. I tried to avoid my shame. And what I did was, I tried to bury my shame so deeply within myself that I hoped to, for, in time, forget what had happened. In time, I hope that the events that transpired, I hope that my mind would just wipe them away and it would be like a clean slate. So yeah, I avoided it. Oh yeah, I definitely avoided it. Grade five. I never even went to grade five, primary school. Someone saying they know me from grade five. No, you don't. What school you been to? I never went to school. I don't even have a name. These are things that I would say. Because when you are ashamed of something, you are going to place as much distance that you can possibly place between you and that thing. But when you, and I realize this, when you bury a seed, it has no choice but to grow. In the right conditions, a seed can grow. So when you bury a seed, Let's say you bury a a mango seed in fertile ground and you water the seed and you take care of the seed. The seed is going to grow, right? Now imagine your seed of shame, if you will. You have a tiny little situation and you want to forget it, so you bury it deep inside. And every time someone talks about that situation, every time someone mentions that situation, every time someone avoids that situation... And you pretend as if it didn't happen, you're watering it the seed a little bit more and more. With your own embarrassment. With your own self-loathing. So you keep on watering the seed, watering the seed, watering the seed, and eventually the seed sprouts. So now it has taken root inside of you. And when shame has taken root inside of you, it is much harder to deal with.
for me. Because the shame had taken root inside of me, it was so difficult for me to overcome. Speaking about that situation, dealing with that situation, it was so difficult, it was so hard for me to overcome because it had taken root inside of me and I had allowed that seed of shame to be watered every time I avoided the situation, every time I refused to speak about the situation, every time I completely just pretended as if it did not happen. I watered a seed inside of myself that I didn't know I was watering, and I fertilized something that I didn't know I was fertilizing. I was fertilizing self-hatred. I was fertilizing self-doubt. I was fertilizing something telling myself, you are something to be ashamed about. Don't talk about it. Just shut up. And I allowed that to take root within my spirit, within my soul. And when you allow things like that to take root inside of you, when you allow shame to take root inside of you, eventually you become the thing that you are running away from. The shame that you are running away from, the shame that you don't want to be associated with, you begin to carry it on your face. You begin to walk into the world with your head bowed down, trying to make yourself smaller. Because you think if someone looks at you, they'll see the shame that's on the, on the inside of you. So your head's all bowed down, your, your body all scrunched up, your posture, your, your back in straight. Because you are so afraid that if you stand tall, I was so afraid that if I stood tall, someone was going to be like, and you was the same by the nanny up yourself. And that seed would grow when I completely avoided the situation. And so with shame, I learned to stop avoiding it. So let me tell you what I did. I faced it head on. I faced my shame head on. You know how I started to do that. What I started to do was, and fun, funny enough, the most recent incident was in a creative writing class that I took uh, last semester. I love this class. This class was amazing. This class was so wonderful. And in class, we had to talk about an embarrassing incident that happened to you. Something that happened to you that you were like, so like ashamed about. And... Now I know what you're thinking, John. The first thing you think about is when you nanny up yourself. But honestly, that's the most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to me. So I talked about it. And I laughed about it. And we laughed about it. And I claimed it. You have to claim your shame. You have to take ownership of the fact that you were ashamed, that you probably are ashamed, but it's yours to carry. No one else can carry that shame for you. No one else can carry that embarrassment for you. It is yours to carry. You have to acknowledge the fact. Listen, let me tell you something. Avoiding something never works. And I realize that. I realize that. When it comes to things like shame, avoiding it never works for me. Let me say for me. I keep saying for me because this is how I experienced it. Avoiding it never worked. I can avoid something and avoid something and avoid something as much as I want. But at the end of the day, something would happen and it would come right back up. Because it's a seed. As much as you want to bury a seed, eventually those leaves are going to see the sunshine. As much as you want to bury a seed, eventually those leaves are going to breach the earth and they're going to see the sunshine. So as much as you want to bury your shame, eventually that is going to sprout and grow into something else entirely different that's going to reflect on your character and the way you behave in the outer world. So it starts off as shame, and then it becomes, like I said before, self-hatred. Because now, I'm ashamed of myself, so I don't love myself. Now, I'm ashamed of myself, so I don't see any value in myself, because I made this one mistake years ago. 
And now it goes from self-hatred to hating other people because you may not see the value in other people. Because you feel as if they won't see the value in you because of this incident that happened years ago. And what I love about, and this is what I love about, and my faith is so important to me for this reason. Let me tell you what I love about God. God gives you, my God gives me courage. My God gives me courage. He gives me strength. And he gives me the ability to speak about this incident freely. Freely. I can say this happened and I can laugh about it. I can laugh about it now. Before I would cry. I would cry. I genuinely would cry because I was so appalled. I was horrified at the fact that I could do this. But now I can laugh about it. Because God gave me this courage to speak about this incident. And in doing so, in him giving me the courage, I was able to claim my shame. I was able to recognize that the shame of the past does not affect my future circumstance. That that incident that happened in the past was meant to be left in the past. And a lot of times our shame only survives because we allow it to carry on. So, ladies and gentlemen, don't, please don't allow your shame to be the end of you. Don't allow your shame to grow within you. Face it head on. Don't be afraid of it. It's a part of you. As much as your hair is, as much as your clothes are, as much as your face is a part of you, that shame that happened, it's a part of you too. So claim it. Take ownership of it. Now, I don't avoid the situation. Yeah, it's the way to nanny up myself. Of course. Of course, I. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, that was me. That was me. I'm the boy that nanny up myself. I'm also the boy that wrote two books. Now what? Now what? Because that happened in the past. And this is my present. So, it doesn't matter anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to take possession of your shame. You can't allow someone to weaponize what is yours. And that shame is yours. So you take hold of that shame. And you face it head on. Until one day, eventually you will realize that what you were so afraid of is nothing more than a memory. And for the next two weeks until the next episode, I want you to sit down and think about something that you feel ashamed about. Think about it for however long you need to think about it. And then get up and look at yourself in the mirror and you say to yourself, this thing happened and I've overcome it. This thing happened and I am overcoming it. Or this thing happened, and I am going to overcome it. My name is John Shaquille Poitier Jr., and it was my privilege to talk to you all today on Darling, I'm Depressed Again. Don't tell my mother. Until next time, God bless.